So I got a brand new series start for you guys next week. It's called Unguarded. It's, uh, it's the steps that ended up in, with Peter's denial, doing a little bit of study of Peter. This month, we've kind of been doing a study of us, human nature and how we are. And next week, we're going uh, to start a series. We're going to start studying the Bible, a character in the Bible. Uh, if you felt a little uncomfortable in worship today, good. Good. <laughs> that was the point. Um, it takes a while to get used to what's called free-form worship. Um, it's uncomfortable. Uh, if you don't know what to say, don't know what to do, don't know what to feel, um, that's good. That, that's, it's kind of a gauge to find out if you worship in your own time, if you worship at home, if you can sing a new song. The Bible says that we are to sing in the spirit, we're singing the understanding. And so we're, we're kind of working on some stuff. But anyway, bear with us. Um, my vocals used to sound good, but they are not there anymore. But it doesn't matter. The Bible says... Make a joyful noise, and we can do that. We can make a noise, all right? <laughs> I've really enjoyed this study, and, and yes, I did survive last week. My wife did not beat me too bad from all the things that I said and did, uh, but I really have enjoyed this series. We've studied words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and today we're going to study physical touch. How many of you in here believe that your love language is physical touch? You believe that that's your love language. You like someone giving you a massage, holding your hand. Uh, so like one of my best friends, Brian Cruz, his love language is physical touch. And if you ever see me and him like at the movies or something, you'd think that something was weird because like it, it's nothing for me to like sit with my arm around him and like touch him and like as we're talking or whatever, he's always like touching me or whatever. And for an occupation, he's a barber. So he gets to touch people all day long and get his love tank filled, filled, because that's his primary love language. And some people, you know, like, I thought mine was touch, and it really isn't. Um, I liked when my mom would scratch my back as a kid. You know, she would, like, take her long fingernails and gently scratch my back. But the more and more I, I, I thought about it, I'm not touch. That's not my love language. Because if I'm really like in my computer writing and my wife wants to come up and try to give me a sh a, like a shoulder massage or touch me while I'm writing, I'm like, get off me. Like, back up. Can someone get me a, a tissue or a towel? I'm like, I'm pushing her away. Or like, if I'm working on something, I'm sweaty and she wants to try to give me a kiss on the back of the head. I'm like, hey, I'm sweaty. Like, ew. If you're the kind of person that pushes people away at any time that they're trying to touch you for whatever reason, your primary love language is not touch, okay, is not touch. Babies who are held and hugged and kissed develop a healthier emotional life than those who are left for long periods of time without physical contact. It's a proven fact. It's proven. The art of speaking the love language of physical touch, though, is one that has a very fine line, especially in society today. It is not okay to say that your primary love language is physical touch and then just go touch people who don't want to be touched by you. Huh? Maybe you take in one of those classes at your job that you had to sign off on, right? It's called harassment. <laughs> Can't just go touching people just because you want to touch them, all right? But let me, let me kind of give you the biology behind this. There's these tiny tactile uh, receptors that are located throughout your body. And when those receptors are touched or pressed, nerves carrying impulses go straight to the brain. And the brain then decides, was that warm or was that cold? One of the most sensitive places on your body to, uh, to, to moisture is actually the bottom of your foot. The bottom of your foot. And so if you ever watch like some of those survival shows, whatever, those guys don't wear any shoes, they'll go and they'll step on things to find out if there's water in the ground because they can sense that. You can sense whether something's hard or soft by those receptors, whether something feels good or something hurts. Was, was the way they touched me love or was the way they touched me hostile? Physical touch can make or break 
a relationship. It can communicate love or it can communicate hate. So we need to know something about physical touch in a marriage relationship, and I'm just gonna say marriage relationship. I know that there's a lot of touching that goes on outside of marriage relationships, but I'm just talking about marriage relationships today. There are two types of appropriate touching in a marriage relationship. And the first one we're gonna call love touches. Love touches. Love touches, I'm sorry, we're gonna call both of these love touches, but the first love touch can be what we call explicit. Explicit. And just by hearing the word explicit, it's exactly what I'm intending it to mean. And explicit touching demands full attention. Explicit touching demands full attention. I need to be into this moment. I need to be understanding what I'm doing with explicit touching. And then there's implicit touching, which requires very little thought or intention, okay? It is never appropriate to touch your spouse in a way that damages your relationship. It is never okay to touch your spouse in a way that damages your relationship. That is simply abuse. Okay? You gotta understand that. But we need to understand love touches. We need to understand explicit touches and implicit touches. And today, I'm going to give you the PG version, although originally I wrote the triple X version, <laughs> and they said that that would not be appropriate for church, so I had to scale it back to the PG. I'm not even allowed to do PG-13. They said it was too much, all right? Explicit touches take thought and intention. I'm I wrote this very PG. Explicit touches are used to create a response and to lead to an intended end. Are you following me? Okay. A specific response that leads to an intended end, and I'm not gonna give you any examples of those today. If you need to come in for some counseling, we can do that at some other time. Implicit touching is like sitting on the couch next to each other and you let your feet touch each other your hand reaches over and touches, right? Watching a movie. Your, your spouse is in the kitchen and you happen to brush by them in the kitchen in like a little flirty manner. That's, that's an implicit touch, right? You're out at the grocery store or whatever and, and your spouse kind of whoop, gives you one of these in public. <laughs> that's kind of an implicit fun, a squeeze of the shoulder when you know that they're tense. But wouldn't you know it? I gotta talk to the men for a minute. Wouldn't you know it, men? Men don't understand implicit touching. <laughs> men don't understand implicit touching. Men think every touch is explicit. <laughs> every touch, we get our signals crossed all the time. We're at, yo, we at the grocery store. She wants to be cute. Whoop, right now. <laughs> She's like, no. I'm trying to buy gondolas. <laughs> Beans. <laughs> we think that every touch of our body is explicit and is supposed to lead somewhere. And when it doesn't, we pout like babies. We throw a fit, have an attitude. And yes, I'm sure this is the case for some women as well. Some women who don't get the hint from their hubby like, yo. But it's more frequent in the mind of man than it is in females. But I'm sure this is the case on both sides where we get our signals crossed. Was that an implicit touch? Like, was that just flirty and fun? Or like, we going somewhere. Come on, somebody. Act like you ain't never got your signals crossed and then pouted. Got upset. So then what happens? We think every touch is an invitation to do more touching and when she really didn't mean it that way, we get upset, we get pouty, then we pull away and touches are less. 
She stops touching you in those implicit ways. She stops flirting in those ways because she doesn't want the whole confrontation. She doesn't want the whole fight. So the thing that you want, you want her to touch you. She ain't no touching you no more because every time she touches you, you think she meant something else. And before you think that I'm beating you up, I've asked my wife to tell you a little bit about me. <laughs> and about my pouting. So this argument was often when we first got married. When Pastor Mike and I first got married, I was still in college. I was actually finishing up my last semester in school. And so I'd leave at 8 in the morning, I'd get home at 10 o'clock at night, throw in a two-hour commute. In that time, I was tired when I came home. I was trying to finish up. And so I'd come in and I'd be like, oh, you know, just trying to snuggle him, <laughs> want to go to sleep. He not wanting to go to sleep. <laughs> and then he'd get mad. But then, like, the weekends would come, and then he thought that we was having to make up for every night of the week. <laughs> And after a while, you start to get frustrated because it's like, is this, a, you don't want to have a conversation with me? Like, is this all you want? <laughs> so then you stop touching. You're like, I'm like, I can't be bothered. I got dinner to cook. I got a house to clean. Like, yeah. And it caused major separation. Between the two of us. Yeah. And then, like he said, he's very, when he's doing something, he's in it. So then, you know, you, you try to touch him. And then I'd be like, I can't never touch him. So then now, she feels rejected. I feel rejected. And I took the test myself, and mine are quality time and physical touch. I like to snuggle. Like we always talk, one day we're going to have one of those ginormous love sack couches that are like beds. Because I just like to snuggle. Yeah. But it's a problem when the communication's not there. So finally, I realized I just got to be like, babe, can we just snuggle now? I am not trying to do anything right now. <laughs> yes. This. I need you to hug me right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and that created a lot of hostility between the two of us uh, because we didn't have the communication, we didn't have the tools. So I would, I would snuggle just to get what I wanted and then she would give me what I wanted just to snuggle. And so it ended up being like acts of service when it really wasn't supposed to be that. There was a lot of this fighting, a lot of this arguing, a lot of the breakdown in our relationship um, because of the mixed signals, especially with uh, touch. Thank you, Cindy, appreciate you. A lot of men think that their love language is physical touch just because they want the explicit. And then, listen, that's a primary need of man. It doesn't have to be his love language to want that. That's being a man. That's having that, that drive, that caveman mentality with the club and boom, and drag her home. Like that's, <laughs> that's the animalistic side of a man. That doesn't mean that it's your primary love language. And when you think it is, that because you want that, that that's your primary love language, you're gonna get your signals crossed and you're not gonna be fulfilled. Because, because for some people who, who they get that crossed, they think the act of that kind of touching is going to fulfill them, but they're really quality time. So what that kind of touching needs to be is quality connection. Communication in that moment. Eye contact. Verbal cues. I want to be here with you. I don't want to be doing this by myself and you just happen to be there. Come on. I mean, we could do a whole seminar just on this because we get that part wrong. We get the bedroom wrong so many times because we get this stuff confused. Mm. But if you do discover that touch is your primary love language, whether male or female, then there's no limit to the creative ways that you can touch each other in a life-giving way. There might, like, you might be a hand holder 
Some people are not hand holders, right? Some people are snugglers. Some people are not snugglers. Like, I know people, that they've got their chair, he's got his chair, and they, that's it. They don't share chairs. But if it is yours, if, if touch is your love language, then be creative. Be spontaneous. But then communicate what that touch was. Communicate what that kind of touch was. Listen, I want you to get this today. Whatever there is of me resides in my body. So let's just think about this. We are a spirit, we have a soul, but we live in a body. Everything about me is inside this body. My thoughts are in this body. My dreams are in this body. My emotions are in this body. So everything of me resides in my body. To touch my body is to touch me. To touch my body is to touch my soul. To touch my body is to touch my emotions. To withdraw from my body is to distance yourself from me emotionally. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a fact. That's a fact of your relationships. That's a fact of your marriage. The less we touch, the further apart we are emotionally. If your loved one is physical touch, then you need to understand that they're gonna need that more. That to know that to feel loved, they're going to need to be touched more often, okay? Let me give you an implicit touch example. If I reached out my hand to shake your hand, and you don't respond accordingly and reach your hand out, how, does I, how do I feel? You rejected me. That's, and that's a simple, implicit touch. I reach out my hand, and then I'm embarrassed. Especially if, now you look around, anybody see me holding my hand out like this? And nobody? So, uh, or like, all right, I'll just save it for later, whatever, you know, because you're embarrassed. But you didn't reject the handshake. You rejected me because everything of who I am resides in this body. To reject a touch from me is to reject me. So how does this apply biblically? I struggled, I'm gonna be honest with you, I struggled this week pulling out verses of the Bible to talk to you about physical touch. Because I didn't want to just talk about Jesus who touched people and then he's not here anymore. Because I believe that we need a touch today. We need a touch in the present. So first, you know, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip my first passages um, upstairs. I'm gonna move on to um, Matthew 8, verse one. Because I wanna take some time at the end here. Matthew 8, verse one, it says this. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before Jesus and said to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Now, let's take a look at this for a minute because this is very, very important. It says that Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. There are multiple stories in the Bible that Jesus healed people and never touched them. He says, be healed, your loved one's okay. Go home, your daughter will live. Be it unto you according to your word. Never had to touch them. He would many times say, your sins are forgiven you, and then they were healed. But why did he touch this man? He didn't have to touch him. He didn't have to touch all those boils and his skin falling off that gnat. Like, yeah. You ever watch Dr. Pimple Popper? <laughs> That's the nasty. I don't want to touch that. If I could just say be healed, I didn't have to touch that. I'm good. But it was more 
than a touch of healing. This man hadn't been touched in years. Nobody would touch this man. His skin was falling off. Nobody wanted to catch cooties. More than a healing, this man needed a touch. More than a miracle, he needed to feel the hands of love upon him. This man didn't only get a miracle in, in, in healing, but he got a restoration of his emotion when the touch of God, the Lord, the Messiah, put his hands on him, it refreshed his soul. Come on, somebody. Jesus knew the importance of his touch. But how does this look today? Because, because there's a lot of people who've been Christians a long time and they've never experienced a touch from God. A lot of Christians who, you know, maybe they're watching online or, or maybe you're in the room and, and you're in a worship moment like this and you just felt nothing. You felt no connection. You didn't feel the presence of the Lord. You didn't feel the anointing of God. And it's just, this is nice. This is different. Dude's screaming a lot. <laughs> but you couldn't really enter in because there's no touch. There was no feel, there's no connection. How, how, do, how do we answer that? And I'm gonna do my best today, okay? The answer is simple and it's complex. How do I get a touch from God? How do I feel the presence of God? It's simple and complex. So the simple answer is, we experience a touch from God through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the simple answer, okay? Or maybe that's the complex answer. We experience a touch from God through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Here's the deeper step. But unless you surrender to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you will not experience a touch from God. Unless you let go of your intellect and your logic, you will not experience a touch from God. Because God can never, a, a, a God who is spirit can't operate in logic and intellect. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We'll never understand the mind of God. We'll never understand the mind of God. But I can understand the presence of God. I can understand that he is with me always, even to the very end. That he will never leave me nor forsake me that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and abides in my mortal body, that I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I can begin to understand these things. And just like this man with leprosy, he says, I am willing. Not only am I able, but I am willing to touch your life. But if you want to operate in logic and you want to operate in intellect, although I am willing, although I am able, although I am moving, you won't notice it. And that's, that, that's the misstep of a lot of Christians today. They have plenty of opportunity. They have plenty of worship services. They're around other believers who operate in the presence of God, but they simply don't notice it because they're not aware of it. So let's talk, let's talk. Pastor Mike, I want to experience a touch from God, but how? But how? And I'm already, I'm already feeling some, some of these like ideas like I've tried this a gazillion times. Then stop trying. Your try is the problem. Your try is the problem. Your effort's the problem. Your timeline's the problem. Timeline, right? We want to put $5 in the bank today 
and get $10,000 in interest tomorrow. Your timeline's off. The presence of God is a lifetime of growth. It's a lifetime of lessons. It's a, it's a lifetime of walking in moments. And, and each time you're in the presence of God, you learn something new. It changes something about you. So the first thing, I wanna experience the presence of God. First step, gotta be born again. Gotta be born again. John 3, three through six, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God. No one can experience the presence of God unless they are born again. And then this dude, Nicodemus, he was like, how can I be born again when I'm old? Can't go back in my mom's belly, what are you talking about? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? And Jesus is like, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. You gotta understand first and foremost that you are a spirit. That's, that's what you are. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You have a mind, will, and emotion, and you happen to live in a body for up to 120 years. If you think about yourself that way, then you understand, I was born into the flesh, but I must be now born into the spirit. No one can enter unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. So the spirit man must be alive unto God. We call that the baptism into the name of Jesus, salvation, you're a child of God, you're born again, but then there's a second step. Now, a lot of churches miss the second step. It could be all in one step if we taught about it more, but there is a second step. We have the baptism into the name of Jesus. This is salvation. This is being born again. But then there is another baptism. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you become born again, you get saved. The Holy Spirit lives and abides on the inside of you. But then we want to have the Acts 1-8 experience. The Acts 1-8 experience says, but you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. He's within me at salvation, but I want him upon me to do what? Then you will become a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You'll receive power when he's upon you. Now, he doesn't have to fall from heaven because he's already here. He just has to come up from the inside upon. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give an opportunity today here at the end of the service for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Due to COVID restrictions, we're not gonna do a line, we're not gonna lay hands on people, we're not gonna do those sort of things, but we're gonna pray. As a church, we're gonna give a moment where we offer it. And after that, if you still don't have clarity, it didn't work for you, it, you didn't feel like you got anything, we will have care team members right down here in the front. Uh, we'll have some music still playing, we'll keep the lights kind of dim, uh, but you can come here and talk to a care team member uh, about that uh, afterwards if, if it doesn't happen for you, okay? And the third is this, the third is this, opportunity, opportunity. If you never take time to be in the presence of the Lord, you're not going to experience it. If you go from work into your car, listening to the radio or the news, come home, got the TV on, kids running around, and, and your day is just jam-packed where there's no quiet time, there's no alone time, then you will not experience the presence of God because you didn't create opportunity to be aware of his presence. You have to put yourself in a place to experience God's presence and his touch. I pray this morning that although worship may have looked different and it may have felt different, I pray that you felt the difference, that you felt that there was a tangible presence of God in the room. Whether we were good or not, whether the singing was good, the Bible never says that your singing has to be good. It just has to be pure. It just has to be in spirit and in truth. It has to come from a heart of worship. I don't care if you can sing a lick. 
You can. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> this is make a noise. Make a noise. Make a grunt. Like, whoop, whoop. Something. But when you keep it inside, you stay in bondage. When you keep it inside, you stay insecure. When you stay inside and you give a half mast worship, you're not going to ex feel the expression and the presence of God in the way you're asking, God, touch me! But you won't do anything to touch him. We, we, we equate a lot of times, I want a touch from God, but then, but then we make all these rules that, that we have for ourselves. But the lights have to be off, and we have to be under the covers. Can't, can't look at me. And then we're, we're doing the same thing with God. I want, I want a touch from God, but turn all the lights off so nobody in this place can see me. And I'm just going to go like this, but I want to feel it. I was just like, you got to create the opportunity. You have to create space. You have to step out of a comfort zone into the unknown. So first, have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? If you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Thank you for accepting me just as I am. Thank you for loving me just as I am. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're saved. You're saved. Have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let me bring these lights down for a little bit. Are you baptized in the Holy Spirit? And the Bible says that one of the main evidences, and again, I'm from Pentecostal, and they would tell you the only evidence that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit is the evidence of speaking in tongues, and I, 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 can't, I can't fully prove that that is the only evidence. There's a whole lot. Do you operate in power? Is your life a witness? Those are the things. It just so happened that when that anointing came upon them, they spoke a heavenly language. And that heavenly language was understood by the people all around in their own languages. That's how powerful that tongue was. So today I want to offer you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And again, if you think I'm the weirdest guy in the world, I love you too. That's so cool. I'm not. I'm really not. I'm not a weird guy. I'm not super flaky. But if it was not for the baptism of the Holy Spirit your boy would have committed suicide multiple times already. All right? Straight out facts. I'm probably one of the most insecure people you've ever met. I probably doubt myself more than anybody else in this entire room. I struggle with depression and anxiety on a daily basis. And if it was not for the anointing of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit, praying in other tongues to build myself up in my most holy faith, I would not be here today, especially with the kind of year we had this year. I don't say any of that to make you feel sorry for me or look at me any different. If you do, that's your problem. I say that today to tell you this, that you could be the most shy insecure, depressed person in the world and get the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it could turn you into a powerhouse. My parents had to spank me to get me on stage to sing as a kid. That's how shy I was. Come on, somebody. What you see today is simply a work of the Holy Spirit. So, I'm going to do this today, and we're already a little bit over time, but it's good. We need this. I'm going to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you would just stand up with me, put yourself in a posture. <clears throat> and have you, 
have never, ever, ever even heard of this, and this is the most foreign thing in the world. That's okay. It, it may take time. It may take a couple teachings. We're, gonna, we're actually formulating a small group just for this to help people and show them and to train them because, because we don't do it very often on a Sunday. But I could not finish a series on touch and not get a touch from heaven. I could not teach on touch and not formulate a worship set that touched heaven and heaven touched earth. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. If you're here today, you are born again. That's the prerequisite. You are born again, but you want to feel the presence of God. You, you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand because that could cause weirdness. Just make the decision in your heart. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want the power of God to rise up on the inside of me and overtake me. I want the gift of speaking in other tongues. We're going to offer that to you right now. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you promised that you would send us another that Jesus, when you left, you said that you would send us the promise who was the Holy Spirit, who would be our comforter, who would be our guide. So right now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to rise up on the inside of every believer, that you would come upon them in the gift of the Spirit, in the, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray right now that as we begin to speak out in a moment of prayer, that you would fill our mouths with your words, that we would pray in other tongues, that we'd pray in the language of the Spirit, God, that you would anoint us, that you would empower us, that you would endue us with power like your word promises. I pray, God, I pray today that we would not leave disappointed, but that we took the first step. I pray, God, for those who feel uncomfortable right now, and that's good, thank you, I'm glad. We need to feel uncomfortable sometimes in the presence of God. So Lord, today, baptize us with your Holy Spirit. Rise up from the inside of us. If you're here today and you have never spoken other tongues, let me, let, me, let me speak to you like this. The way you say a word in English is you, your brain thinks about it. Your brain sends a signal to your vocal cords. Then your tongue flaps up and down that says syllables that creates words. When we pray in the Holy Spirit, we're gonna bypass our mind, we're gonna allow our spirit man to kind of send that signal to our vocal cords, make our tongue flat, and we're gonna say words. We're gonna speak by the Spirit. Father, we thank you for that right now, that as we open our mouths and begin to pray, that you would fill it with your words in Jesus' name. Go ahead and fill our mouths, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you want to continue in that moment, continue with more information, continue with a touch, we will have care team members right down here in the front. If you are leaving today like, man, that was really weird. I don't even know if I want to come back to this church. I love you. There's great churches all over Middletown. But I'll tell you this. You don't need somebody to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You don't need someone to baptize you in water. You can go home, get in your bathtub, baptize yourself. Jesus said to the man, go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times. Ain't nobody dip him. Ain't nobody dunk him. But he wanted that expression. He wanted that step. He wanted to do something different. If you felt insecure today, you didn't want to say something out loud in your mouth, man, in your car, all by yourself, turn on some music, try to do what I just did. Let it go. Have fun with it. Have fun with God. Have fun with the presence of God. Have fun trying stuff out. If you're willing to have an encounter with God, there's no limit to your creativity. Just like the touching. There's no limit. 
There's no limit. And as you begin to practice that, I get up in the morning and while I'm in the shower, I build myself up. And I, and I hope that throughout my day, I'll be like, there's something wrong with this person. I need to go talk to them. There's something going on over here. I need to go talk to them. I now begin to be led by the Spirit. I begin to operate by the Spirit. And somebody say, how did you know that? I didn't know. I just felt something. And I operated on that feeling. God made me feel something and I acted on it. And because of that, it ends up changing someone's life. And listen, seriously, man, this is, this is a big struggle for me. This is a big struggle for me. This shouldn't be weird. This shouldn't be weird. I mean, this is Bible. This is how the Acts 2 church was founded. This, 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 is, how, this is how heaven touched earth. This, this, is, this is, this is the Pentecost movement. This is the thing that created Christianity to what it is today. But because it's weird and it's, and it's different and, and I don't feel like I got anything and I don't understand it, then, then we stamp somebody as a weirdo and a flake. And if you leave here today with the joy of the Lord, if you leave here today with the peace of God, then you felt the difference. You felt the difference. I hope you felt the love of God today. I hope you felt the acceptance of God today, that you are accepted just the way you are. You are accepted in this church with all your faults, with all your hangups, with all your hurts, with all your baggage. Welcome home, me too. Welcome home. If God could use a burning bush and God could speak through a donkey, he could use you too. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. Lord, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the blessing that you've given unto us. I pray that we will operate and walk in your power and in your might, that our lives will be a witness. We would experience your presence every day of our lives. Help us to make room for you. Help us to make moments where we can feel your presence and know that you are there. Lord, for those who are still searching and still discovering, I pray that they would take a step of faith today and talk to one of our care team members. I think as we leave here today, everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I love you. Get ready for the